All right. So this is the last segment looking at Paul, the conversion of Saul to Paul. And the last segment is entitled Transformed by Christ before and after. So this goes back to the very beginning when we were looking at, you know, talking about before and after pictures, like a weight loss pictures or home improvements. But now we are relating this to Saul, the before and after, looking at how he was before he was converted to Christ. Now, let's look at the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, and we're going to look at the 19th through the 25th verse. Okay, so let's look at these verses here. All right. And it states, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by providing that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So before and after. So Saul would one day write that every believer in Christ has become a new creation. He was writing from experience. Having encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, he will be satisfied only if others would have the same opportunity so through his words, through his words, before and after. So Saul was blinded in his encounter with Jesus Christ. He also stopped eating and drinking. He may have lost all desire for nourishment or voluntarily begun a period of fasting to seek God to understand what had happened to him. After his healing and encouragement from Ananias, Saul ate again and was strengthened. Immediately, he began to proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus made the same claim at his trial. His accusers charged him with blasphemy, punishable by death. Saul's listeners were astonished. They had fully expected him to carry out his mission of arresting disciples and taking them back to the chief priests in Jerusalem. However, in the same way that onlookers witnessed great physical miracles of healing and judgment in the book of Acts, they were witnessing the spiritual miracle of Saul's transformation from opponent of the faith to one who argued conclusively that Jesus is the Messiah. All right. And then Saul's powerful preaching brought opposition from those who did not believe. They banded together to kill him. However, other believers rescued him by lowering him in a basket to the ground outside the city wall. So this was an amazing event right here going on. Transformation going on right before their eyes. Right before their eyes. And so here is my question. Why is it important for non-believers to see both miracles of physical healing and miracles of lives turned entirely around? Why do you think it's necessary for non-believers to see the physical aspect and the miracles, you know, something going on in their lives where they turn around, not necessarily a physical aspect, but other areas of their lives? What is that? Why do you think that is so essential? Why is that so important? And it's important for them to see the power of God to see that God is not playing no games, okay? He's He's not playing this little game with you. Like, he is real. And so it is important for non-believers to see both aspects because they need to know that God is real, okay? That he 
is an almighty God. He is powerful and he can do anything. There is no boundaries. Okay. He can do it. He can heal anybody. And I don't care how sick they are. He can do it. Or another type of miracle. If a person has a, a type of addiction or whatever, he can heal them of that addiction. He can remove it. And whether it's an addiction to drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, or whatever the case may be, he can remove it where to the point that it, they'll feel like they never done it before. Okay. So they do need to see and understand both um, perspectives or not perspectives or both aspects of this process to show that he is the almighty God. Okay. That he can do it. Like ain't nothing stopping me. I can do it. If I want to do it, I can do it. I'm God. You know, I can do it. All right. And so that would be very, very essential to a non-believer. And in this situation here, that is exactly what God was showing them. Like y'all saw all the bad things, the awful things that Saul was going around here doing. But now look at him. I did it. Saul didn't do this on his own. I did this to him. Did Saul even have any intentions of even converting? No. It just came out of nowhere, a detour in his life. And detours do happen in our life sometimes. It does. Okay. And sometimes we have a little light bulb that finally click in our head about certain things. Like, you know what? I need to stop that. I don't need to be doing that. And then other people be sitting there looking at you like, well, what's wrong with you now? You don't want to do this no more. You don't want to do that no more. No. Have no desire. And who did it? God. God just did it. God did it. And I've seen him work some miracles through some people. He did it. All right. And so looking at the next part here, meeting the church at Jerusalem, the Acts, still coming from Acts, the ninth chapter, the 26th through the 31st verse. And it states, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fiercely in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He taught and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Sisera and sent him off to Tarshish. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So God took this situation here and used it for his purpose, purpose for his will. And now the church increased in numbers, increased. All right, so meeting the church at Jerusalem. So Saul was not alone in his zeal for Christ. Long before his experience on the Damascus road, Jesus' disciples, some of them chosen as apostles, were testifying for him. Saul's first effort to meet with them was marked by fear. Someone, however, recognized his genuine con conversion and helped him toward acceptance. OK, because I know it was scary because these people here looking like, wait a minute now, he was out here trying to kill people like me, followers of Jesus. And y'all think I'm going to let him come up in here. He might, you know, try to kill all of us in here. So, yeah, that's how everybody was looking like. I don't know. I don't know about him coming up in here like this. But then Barnabas was the only one was like, y'all, let's give him a chance. Let's give him a try. Like, I, I really think that. He, he's converted now. He he is real. Like he's 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 honest. He's true. He's humble now. Okay, <laughs> Barnabas, and that's when the rest of them are like, all right now, you know. <laughs> all right. So after three years, Saul went to Jerusalem to try to join himself in fellowship to some of the earliest Christian converts. His last appearance there was marked by violent persecution of the church. Not surprisingly, they feared he was masquerading as a disciple to bring them harm. 
Saul, however, found a friend in Barnabas, a Levite from the island of Cephas, also called Joseph or Joseph. The apostles called him Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement. Having heard what Saul had experienced in his conversion and how he had testified of Christ in Damascus, Barnabas took Saul to the apostles and shared this report. This gave Saul opportunity to preach at Jerusalem as he had at Damascus. This brought him into conflict with Hellenistic Jews. Again, his life was threatening and believers in Jerusalem sent him to Tarshish, his birthplace. Luke concluded this section of the book of Acts with a broad summary statement about the state of the church now spread throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. A lull of persecution resulted in a time of peace. Believers grew spiritually and the entire church grew numerically with the help of the Holy Spirit. Numerically. All of a sudden, the church was transformed and grew even more. Even more because of this incident here. Even more. So here's a question. It says, Barnabas was a bridge builder between Saul and the earlier apostles. How can his action of introduction serve as a model for us today? Barnabas. Barnabas was a bridge builder. So have you ever been in a situation where, you know, somebody used to do all kinds of crazy things, all kinds of foolishness, and then all of a sudden, you know, they want to start hanging around you or your group? your click or whatever, and y'all looking at them like, you know, we don't deal with him, all that stuff, or she do, no, we don't do that. And then here comes somebody out the group, no, you know what, they don't do that no more. Let's let's give them a try. So sometimes, to be fair, give people a try, give people a chance, okay? Because you don't know that you might inspire them to stay on the right track. So don't be so quick to belittle a person or to push them off or push them to the side. Like, no, I don't deal with her. I don't talk to her. I don't deal with that kind. Don't be so quick to do that. Okay? Give the person a chance. Just give them a chance. And that's all Barnabas did right here. He gave him a chance. All right? Just give people a chance sometimes. All right? And he was the bridge between a believer and an unbeliever. He was a helper. And that's all he wanted to do was just to help. All right. And that's what Barnabas did. So what is God saying to us? The Bible states many times that nothing is impossible for God. One proof that he provides is the dramatic turnaround in the life of Saul, Paul. Christians can be encouraged to believe God for great things as they reflect on the story of Saul and on the many other marvelous works God did in and through the early church. Are there individuals who reject the gospel regardless of how it is presented? Are there cities where it has been difficult to establish a church? Are there entire countries where sinfulness is praised as something good? God is able to change these situations for his glory. As we pray, put our trust in him and commit ourselves to working with him. All right, commit ourselves. So living it out. Identify people you know who needs God's power to save, heal, and transform. Commit yourself to daily prayer for God to move in their lives and in yours. Make yourself available to God to be a part of the answer to your prayers. All right, and then for further study, to learn more about these conversions, Jacob meets God at Bethel, Genesis, the 28th chapter, the 10th through the 22nd verse. God calls Samuel, 1 Samuel, the third chapter, first through the 10th verse. God calls Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the second chapter, first through the 10th verse. Repent and believe the gospel. Mark, the first chapter, 9th through the 15th verse. Newly created in Christ. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the 17th through the 21st verse. Born again by the word, 1 Peter, 1st chapter, 17th through the 23rd verse. And this was an awesome lesson. This was an amazing 
lesson here to talk about the story of the conversion of Saul, Saul becoming Paul, all right? And Paul is going to go on and God is going to use him as an instrument throughout the entire rest of the New Testament, all right? Paul is going to be the author of the New Testament, the majority of it. He's going to write the majority of the New Testament. This guy who was a persecutor of Christians, killing, putting them in prison, you know, torturing them. After people were begging and pleading, please don't do this, please. This guy. God was able to convert him. So this is just a reminder that God can convert anybody. I don't care how hard or how stubborn they are. If God can do this for Saul, God can do this for anybody. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care if it's your child and you just like, I don't know. My child is awful. Or you got a sibling that you just shake your head or you got a cousin or a friend or a loved one and you just like, I like this person is terrible. They always up to no good. Here's a prime example. If God can convert Saul, he can do it to that individual too. He can do it for them. All right. Until next time with Sunday School Lessons and the next lesson will be on the last part I'm finishing up the book of Acts and the evangelizing church. So that'll be the next thing that we'll look at. And that'll be closing out these lessons here on the book of Acts.